encourage you at this time to go ahead and take it out, open it up. We're going to be in Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 8. Today, Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 8. <clears throat> Before we jump in, a couple of things I want to let you know about. First of all, I want to just continue to say thank you to those of you who have been giving. If you are in financial need during this season, maybe you've lost a job, uh, maybe you have been laid off, maybe you've been financially impacted by COVID, maybe you're just in a financial difficult spot for other reasons, I want you to know that right now, because of the season we're in, people in this church have been super generous to help out folks in our church and in our community. If that's you, please reach out to us. We want to help you. Uh, for those of you who wonder, are, are they talking about me? Yes, we're talking about you. So we want to help you. Hope that you would join us in that. Uh, for those of you who continue to give, thank you so much. We keep saying this. We know that it's going to take every single one of us who can give to give during this season. Greatly appreciate your continued generosity. So thankful for it. Uh, you can give online, hnw.org slash give. You can give through the church app, or you can give by dropping a gift in the receptacle, or by bringing it by the office or mailing it to us. Uh, again, thank you for your generosity. I want to talk about Christmas Eve. 2020 has been rough. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. So as we're headed into Christmas Eve, I think it's important, if at all possible, for every one of us to worship with someone else. Now, Maybe that means that you can be with us on campus on Christmas Eve, maybe not, but even if you have to join us online, I want to encourage you to host a watch party if you can, driveway, back porch, if you feel safe indoors, whatever, however makes the most sense for you. But I don't think that we need to celebrate Christmas alone. It's a joyful time, a time to remember the gift given us in Jesus. So we're trying to offer as many options as possible. We didn't get to have the Easter that we anticipated, and so we really want to make this a special season this year. So we will be having uh, services indoors and outdoors and online. So on December 23rd, 7 p.m., we'll have an indoor option and an outdoor option. Uh, you can bring your lawn chairs, blankets, hot chocolate, you know, whatever you need to stay warm. Then again, you might be in your shorts. It is Houston, so who knows. And then on December 24th, we'll have a 4 p.m. That'll only be indoors uh, because it's too bright to broadcast outside, but then at 6 p.m., we'll have indoor and outdoor. So you would really do us a huge favor if you would RSVP. Uh, not, we're not going to turn you away if you haven't RSVP'd. It just helps us make sure that we have enough room for everyone. We don't want any service to be overcrowded, um, to make sure that we have enough available. If we need to add services, add chairs, any of that kind of stuff would be a massive help to us. Well, we've already had hundreds of people RSVP. Please help us out in that. hnw.org slash Christmas. At our Christmas Eve services, at every one of them, we're going to take a special offering. We call it each year our Big Give. Last year, you may remember, we took up an offering to retire medical debt of folks in the area. We were able to retire $3 million of medical debt of our neighbors. It was just incredible. Yeah, we should give thanks for that. Um, so this year, we thought, you know, what could we do? And so we thought about medical debt again, a few other things. But, you know, western Louisiana has been just absolutely crushed this year by hurricanes. And Don made a list for me and just reminded me that whenever we were in need, whenever we were flooded, when we were broken down, literally dozens of churches from around the country came to our help, came to our aid. And so we've already sent a team to western Louisiana, but we've decided that this year for our big give, we want to just repay it as best we can. So we're going to take an offering to support five churches that were destroyed or flooded in those hurricanes in western Louisiana this year, and we want to help them. So you would do a big help to us if you would begin praying now about how you could participate in that. We're also going to use a portion of that offering to go towards our international missions offering, which is known as Lottie Moon. So we would love it if you would begin praying now how you could participate in that great offering on Christmas Eve. Uh, one more thing to let you know about. This past week, an article was published about me and our church. Uh, long story short, I disagree with pretty much everything that's in there. Uh, but um, I just tell you that to let you know, um, if you have any questions about it, you run across it, come talk to me, or you can uh, you know, ask whatever questions you need. But other than that, I'm moving on. We're going to do ministry here. So I just want to let you know that. Next, um, we're going to jump into the text. I'm going to pray over us. And we are going to ask the Lord to come to meet us here in this place and to really speak to us. And uh, I'm grateful, grateful for the opportunity to get to do that, particularly at this time of year. So would you please bow your head with me? Let's come to the Lord and let's ask him to speak to us today.
Father, we need to hear from you. God, we need you to rescue. God, we need you to work. God, we need you to do all kinds of things. Lord, we, uh, we love you. We're grateful for you. So, Father, I pray that you, would, uh, that you would meet us in this place through your spirit. Father, somehow supernaturally, through the words of my mouth, would you somehow connect to the presence of your spirit in the hearts and minds of others? And God, would you please join us, rescue, restore. And God, I pray that you would do that in the name and in the power of your son, Jesus. God, we love you. We thank you. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 8. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. and They were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. This is the word of the Lord. I don't know if you heard it, but KFC has decided to make a lifetime mini movie. I mean, that kind of sums up 2020, doesn't it? I don't really know what else you could see whenever the people who sell fried chicken have decided to recruit Mario Lopez of Saved by the Bell fame to make a mini movie. I'm not making this up. I'm sure you're probably thinking like this is a joke. It's really not. It actually apparently debuts today at noon. If that's something that interests you, you can run home and check it out. Clocking in at 15 minutes, apparently the folks who sell fried chicken ran out of ideas or maybe this is the greatest idea of all time. I'm not sure. And they've decided, we are talking about it after all, they have decided to release this mini movie. Now, I gotta say, I kind of sympathize with the fried chicken folks. I'm gonna tell you why. I mean, there's only so, only so many ways that you can sell fried chicken, right? I mean, like, you've, you've talked about it. You've like, I've had fried chicken. It's the same fried chicken I've had over and over. What else am I going to do? I've got to be creative. It's kind of like, you know, trying to sell Coca-Cola or whatever. You say, I mean, I've had a Coke. It tastes kind of the same. What am I going to do? I've got to come up with creative new ways. And I want to tell you why I sympathize with them. Because every year, I've got to preach this passage. Every year, we're going to read Luke chapter 2, we're going to have the angels, we're going to have the shepherds, and if you have been going to church for any amount of time, you're going to say, what's he going to tell me now? How am I going to hear this any different? In fact, you may not know it, but eight years ago, almost to the exact date, I stood on this stage in view of a call and preached from this passage. Maybe you were here, maybe you weren't. Maybe I should have just recycled that sermon. Maybe you wouldn't even remember it. I don't know. But I'm here to tell you that as somebody who's a pastor, you sort of agonize over Christmas and Easter because you think, okay, these are two stories I'm going to say. How can I seem to make it interesting? And oddly enough, I think that I got some inspiration from the KFC Lifetime mini-movie. No, I haven't watched it yet. I'm not even going to watch it. But here's my point. Here's how I got inspiration. I think that I realized that marketers use demographics. They sit down and they think to themselves about how they want to market something, how they want it to go out, and they think specifically about to whom they will roll out their message. They have a certain type of person that they have in mind when they release their message, and that was the thing that really jumped out to me as I went back into the Christmas story. As I jumped back into Luke 2, the thing that came straight to my mind was, what was it that God was really paying attention to? demographics. He had a particular individual that he wanted to deliver this message of great joy to. And so I want us to talk about that today. I think the first thing I notice here in Luke 2 is that God wanted to deliver a message to people who are forgotten. Joy comes for the forgotten. 
The shepherds, you may or may not know, were likely very young. Sometimes they were older folks, but people are pretty much in agreement that the shepherds were among the lowest of individuals in the social strata of ancient Palestine. In fact, probably the lowest folks were the lepers, people who had uncleanliness attached to them. They were cast out, had to live outside of the city gates. But right above that, in fact, just above the lepers were the shepherds. Wild, uh, I'm sorry, livestock was considered so unclean that in fact they were supposed to only watch their flocks out away, not anywhere near any settlements, but in the wilderness. And we know that according to a set of Jewish writings called the Mishnah. They weren't supposed to be anywhere near people. Now, obviously this is a little different because we read that they're out in the fields by Bethlehem in Luke chapter 2. So why is it that these shepherds were close to town? Glad that you asked. So we know this, that there was a tower that was very near Bethlehem that was tied to the shepherding tradition. The name of the tower is Migdal Eder. Now, this tower was also recorded in the Mishnah, and we read about it a couple of places in Scripture. One of those is Genesis chapter 35, verse 21. We read, Israel journeyed on and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. And then again in Micah chapter 4, verse 8, Micah prophesies and says, You, O tower of the flock, which pretty much everyone agrees is a reference to this tower, hill of daughter Zion, to you it shall come, the former dominion shall come, the sovereignty of daughter Jerusalem. So we don't know exactly where this tower was, but we do know that it was near Bethlehem. Why was it significant? Because for whatever reason, in the Mishnah, there was an exception made for these shepherds. In other words, most of the time, shepherds had to be out away from the city. They were in the wilderness. But for some reason, this particular group of shepherds was allowed to come in close. The Mishnah says that the shepherds and the sheep that are right near the tower of Eder are to be used in temple sacrifice, to be used in temple sacrifice. So what we have here is a group of shepherds that are literally looking out over their flocks. They're up in a tower, looking down, watching over their flocks by night. That's where they are, watching out over their flocks when suddenly an angel appears to them, fulfilling, by the way, the prophecy given us in Micah chapter 4, verse 8. Now, why does this matter? Why does Luke give us this detail that these were the shepherds that were in close to town, that were close to this tower, that were part of the temple sacrificial system? Why would it be that he would give us that detail? Well, I don't guess that we know for sure, but I thought about it a while. And I got to thinking that in the same way that that demographic mattered, I think that Luke wanted us to understand specifically who these shepherds were. These shepherds were likely a little bored, <laughs> maybe a little cynical, because they probably were interacting with the temple priests day in and day out. And you know, I'm not a temple priest. I am a pastor though, and I can tell you, I have my good days, but I certainly have my bad days. And I have days where the people who work with me probably think, aren't you supposed to represent Jesus? Look at you. I'm wondering about those shepherds that day in, day out had to take in sheep to be sacrificed, and that probably had gotten a little bit cynical and even maybe miserable when it came to the process of sacrifice and religion. They just probably had to get to a point where they're thinking, I'm going to raise these sheep my entire life. We're going to kill another sheep. We're going to have another sacrifice, and we're just going to move on and repeat the process over and over and over and over. And these are the people. These are the forgotten ones. These are the miserable ones that God says, those people, those are the ones I want to draw attention to. I don't know about you, but if I was God and I was thinking, I'm going to announce the coming of my son, the people I would choose, I'd probably want someone who had a little bit of money, maybe a network, maybe some kind of platform that they could use to really amplify my message, to get the word out. Maybe that would be the thing that I would choose. That's not who God picks. God picks the forgotten, the invisible, the one that nobody even cares about. This week, a person who maybe falls into the category of Christian celebrity, if there is such a thing or should be such a thing, is an entirely different matter, but a Christian celebrity who made a comment talking about a conference that his ministry was hosting that costs $10,000 a head to attend. And he was complaining a little bit about how he's going to move this, and basically he said, I don't want some $8 an hour twerp, his words, not mine, offending the people who have paid 
$1,000. Now, I understand he's probably coming from a position of passion, probably just wanting to talk about doing their job well. I get all that. But I was struck with the fact whenever I read that quote, God came for the $8 an hour twerp. And I think that sometimes we forget that, right? Each and every one of us go about our lives day by day in this city and we walk by or drive by people who the rest of the world pretty much forgets. The people who are the, the lawn crews on the side of the road, uh, the folks who are cleaning off the tables at the restaurants or delivering the food, people who oftentimes speak different languages than we do, people who oftentimes don't have the level of education or the level of achievement, certainly don't have the level of financial stability that we have. Those are the people that it's easy for us to go right by and treat as invisible or, as we talked about here, forgotten. You see, I don't think it's an accident that God draws attention to them because I know that God knows that for those of us who achieve some level of success, however we choose to define that in our lives, we run the risk of belittling and looking down on those who are just like the shepherds. Now, we really shouldn't do that, and we know that we shouldn't do that. In fact, we even feel it in our heart, but the truth of the matter is, is that it's easy to do. And so I think, who would it be like to be the shepherds to the temple priests? I wonder, would it be like kind of like working in the kitchen of the White House or the governor's mansion where you're so close to power and yet you're still invisible? Who are the ones in our world today who are forgotten? Maybe you're in this room and you feel that you are part of the forgotten class. Maybe you'd say, yeah, I stand at a factory or I, I work the night shift. Or maybe you'd say, no, I have kind of a professional job, but I'm stuck in the role that I'm in and I'm never going to achieve anything. Or maybe just your family's forgotten you. Whoever it is, this is what I want you to know. If you feel forgotten, the great news of Luke chapter 2 and the message that we get from the shepherds is this. God comes for the forgotten. That's the beautiful truth for us today. That if you feel forgotten, if you feel completely invisible, God came for you. For the ones that feel completely overlooked, the shocking nature of the gospel is that after surveying all of humanity, the Lord said, the lowest, the invisible ones, the poor ones, those are the ones to whom I want to begin my message. The forgotten. But it doesn't end there. It's also not just for the, for, for the forgotten, I think, but also for the skeptical, for the skeptical. Now, I don't know if you guys think this is as funny as I do, but I certainly found this to be interesting to me. In verse 12, now think about this, think about the setting. We have an angel who has appeared to shepherds. And in verse 12, the angel says, I'm gonna give you a sign that what I am telling you is true. Now, that just kind of makes me chuckle because I'm thinking that if an angel appeared to me, I don't know that I would need a sign, right? Like, well, I mean, I kind of got the angel sitting right here. I feel pretty confident that what I'm hearing is the truth. But the angel says, I'm going to give you a sign. And, and it, by the way, it was not that I'm going to have a whole bunch of other angels appear, right? Other angels come, that's not enough. He says, I, the angel says, I'm going to give you a sign, and this is the sign. That you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths. Now, we get this sign, I think, because God knows that the people who are often forgotten are probably the same people who feel most skeptical about religion. I have to imagine that those shepherds watching the temple sacrificial system up close, they saw how the sausage was made, so to speak. They probably had to be cynical. And they probably needed some sort of extra sign. You know how it is. You've been in church before. You've heard, you know, the preacher preach, or you've had a moment with God, maybe in prayer or reading your scripture, and you feel like God has been very clear and said, this is what I want you to do. And then for whatever reason, and I couldn't begin to know what that was, but for whatever reason, you suddenly decide, did I really hear that? Did I really feel that? Did I really, truly hear from God? You see, I think that some of us are miserable, some of us are skeptical because we've kind of built this prison for ourselves in our own heart. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not talking about people who've had real true traumatic things happen to them, but I'm talking about the fact that sometimes we make ourselves victims. We make ourselves miserable. You know what I'm talking about, where you, you begin to have everything that you need, everything that you want, but for some reason, 
you convince yourself that life is not good. Sometimes my mom would call this throwing a pity party. I don't know what they called it at your house, but it's this idea that you make yourself miserable. Jack Miles, in his book, God, a Biography, talks about the fact that in Greek tragedy, the hero is affected by circumstances beyond his control, but in Shakespearean tragedy, the hero is affected by circumstances within his heart or her heart. I mention this because I think that many of us are victims or are miserable or have no joy, not because of something that's happened to us, but because we make ourselves miserable. Reminds me a lot of Ebenezer Scrooge from Dickens' Christmas Carol. He too needs a visible sign. He needs the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future to really move him on down the road to deal with those things. But there is something about us where we can get frustrated, have an existential crisis, begin to really get bitter and stuck. As I've already mentioned, 2020 has been tough for a lot of folks. You may or may not have seen that this last week, Gallup released a study on mental health for Americans. And they basically took the results of this year and compared them to last year. And the question was essentially this, would you rate your mental health as excellent? As excellent. And they had tons of different categories, right? They sliced the data all kinds of different ways. And they said, okay, would you relate your mental health as excellent? Did you know that every single category went down this year? You know, they said, yeah, last year it was excellent, but every category, you know, men, women, however they sliced the data, went down. Said, no, it's not as excellent. Every category went down except for one. You know who it was that mental health actually went up this year? People who go to religious services every week. Now, First of all, we already knew that, but I think that on top of that, I think that's essential and important. Why? Because it reminds us that for most of us, our misery is not because of circumstances outside of our control, but it's because of things happening within us. I don't think it's any coincidence or any accident that in 2020, when most of us have been dealing with internal struggles, that the people who saw an improvement in mental health are the people who turned to God week in and week out. I mention this because I think of the skeptical shepherds who were there, who were frustrated, and they're needing to have a real encounter with God. Not just to go to a service, but to truly meet with God. They need a sign, and the angel knows that. I'm gonna give you something that you can hang on to. Now, the question, of course, is this. Does God still give signs? I'm not here to give a a theological lesson on that right now. I'm just going to tell you a story. As I mentioned, eight years ago, I stood on this platform, preached this passage in view of a call to come to this church. What you may not know is that maybe just six weeks prior to that, I was really agonizing over whether or not we should come here. Not because I didn't love this church. It seemed like an amazing church. But I was pastoring another church at the time, and it was a church that I had planted, I had started. And Joy and I just really went back and forth. You know, should we leave the church that God has called us to, that we have planted to go to this other place? We didn't know, and we were really agonizing over it. And it just so happened that at that time in my life, I was reading from the book of Judges, the story of Gideon. Maybe you know that story, maybe you don't. But in that story, Gideon asks the Lord for a sign and says, God, would you make, uh, you know, the grass wet and the fleece dry, or then, then, then the fleece wet and the grass dry, just to show me that you're really telling me to do what it is that I think that you're telling me to do? So, you know, I, I went to Joy that night, and I said, Joy, do you think that God would give us a sign like that? And she's like, well, does he still do that? I'm like, I don't know. I'm just wondering, what do you think? And so she's like, well, what did you have in mind? And I don't even remember how we came to this, but we, we basically prayed a prayer that night. And we said, Lord, If you want us to go to this church this week, three times, would you have somebody say to us, that church, the name of the church we're pastoring, that church is not your church, it's God's church. Amen. And I was like, okay, that's pretty specific. Uh, We'll see what happens. The next day, I was having lunch with uh, one of the volunteers in our church. We were throwing a block party, and for whatever reason, I couldn't attend the block party. I had other kind of conflicts, and so this volunteer was going to be running the block party to reach out into the community. And so I said, hey, I'm really sorry that I can't be there, to which the volunteer said, hey, Steve, don't worry about it. This church isn't your church. It's God's church. 
started getting pretty nervous right after he said that. Might have started to sweat a little bit. A couple days later was Joy's birthday. We went to go eat with some friends and, uh, you know, celebrating, having a great time, and we're having fun. And right after, you know, dinner, dessert's coming out, we're having coffee. And they said, well, you know, what's going on with you guys, like, in your life? You got anything exciting happening? I said, well, you know, we kind of got this big decision. We don't know what to do. We're praying over it. And one of my best friends in the world looks at me and he says, hey, Steve, that's not your church. That's God's church. A few days later, I happened to be at a conference in Corpus Christi. And you already see where this is going, right? Having dinner with one of my friends, you know what he says. And I end up here. I called Joy. This is what just happened at dinner. And she just begins to weep. Why? Why was that so important and impactful for us? I don't know if you guys have been there before, but there are moments when you feel like maybe you're forgotten by God. And you've had these moments where God's felt very, very close and then suddenly feels very, very distant. And maybe, I know that we had been in a season where we had just been trudging. We were just trying to to just keep going, keep our hand to the plow. We were tired, we were frustrated, we felt completely undone. And in that moment, it felt good to hear God say, here's just a little glimpse. I think that God does do that. I don't know that I have a theology of signs, but I think I know enough to know this, that when we feel a little discouraged, a little distracted, we feel skeptical, God will give us just enough of a glimpse to let us know he's still there. He hasn't forgotten us. I share that with you today, not to minimize the scripture, not to minimize the spirit of the living God because the scripture and the spirit of the living God are our enduring and ongoing signs. The scripture continues to speak to us with life. The spirit of the living God continues to be a seal on the guaranteed deposit. We know these things are true. And yet, verse 20, in verse 20, the shepherds show up at the manger and they find the baby. And the baby is wrapped in the swaddling clothes. And what does it say? As it had been told to them. In other words, they saw the thing that God told them through the angel that he would provide and they felt encouraged. Sometimes we just need God to come through so that we can say, Lord, I see who you are. You're trustworthy and you're real. And today I say this to you. The word of God is a sign unto you. The spirit of God is a sign unto you. But if you're in a spot where you're saying, Lord, I just need to know you're still there. I think it's okay to ask him. Say, Lord, could you just show yourself to me in some real specific way so that I would know you still see me. To the forgotten and to the skeptical then, who and what does this God bring? Well, to the miserable and to the skeptical, we find them to be thrilled, to be glorifying and praising God. They are leaving this place genuinely excited. And why? And the answer is because he brought them a message of joy. The angel says that this message is for all people, and it's a message of great joy. The funny thing is, is that for most of us, particularly Americans, joy is at Christmas means maybe being with family or maybe having certain traditions or, or maybe we'll get some sort of gift that we've really been wanting. I think about Ralphie with his face pressed up against the window in the film A Christmas Story where he uses the phrase while looking at the toys, electric joy. <laughs> we think about that maybe sometimes, but that's not the sort of joy that the angels spoke of. The angels instead said this, that God has chosen the forgotten and the skeptical and the grieving and the hurting and the downtrodden to receive joy. What was that joy? The angel comes and says, I'm come to proclaim Christ the Lord. In Greek, it's Christos Kurios. Now, we probably wouldn't put a lot of significance on this, but this is the only place in the New Testament where that phrase is used. Christos Kurios, only place. What did it mean? Well, Christos, the Greek word for Christ, is the same word as Messiah or chosen one. The shepherds probably got excited because when they heard the word Messiah, they had been waiting on a chosen one to come, probably to overthrow the enslaved rule that the Caesars had brought. 
probably to, they probably thought that a babe was born that would grow into a mighty military leader, a king. It would be the equivalent of Americans thinking someone has just been born that one day is going to be elected president and is going to make this whole mess go away. That's probably what they thought in that moment. Now, obviously, that's not who Jesus ended up being, but that's what they thought in that particular moment. Christos. The other word is kurios, the Greek word for Lord, which means boss, overseer. It was just this idea that whoever this Messiah was, this Christ, he would not only be the chosen one to set all things right, but he would also be the one that would be the Lord, that would rule over in the way that he was intended to rule. Christos kurios. In that ancient world, there was a lot of pressure to worship the emperor, and they used a phrase to worship the emperor, Kaiser Curios, Caesar is Lord. They used that phrase whenever they would stand before an image of the emperor and have to throw a little incense on the fire and say, Kaiser Curios. Sometimes there would be parades down the main boulevard in the ancient cities, and they would wave at the Caesar as he went by, and they would say, Kaiser Curios. But a subversive, cheeky action of sorts that the ancient Christians did was they wouldn't say that. Instead, they would say, Christos Kurios. In other words, here goes the emperor, and here's the way that they want us to live according to Roman rule, but we will say instead, Jesus is Lord. Christos Kurios. The chosen one, the Messiah of God, he's the one that tells us the way that we're supposed to live. And this way of living and this way of thinking was part of the backwards, shocking message of joy. This was a place in the church where prayer worked. This was a place where miracles took place. This was a place where forgiveness and grace and love and beauty and truth were at the centerpiece. While the Roman emperor was busy saying that violence and might makes right, Christians were saying, love your enemies. This was a completely different way to live. While they were killing babies in those days that they didn't want or couldn't take care of, Christians were rescuing them from exposure and bringing them in. Hospitals and orphanages exist in today's world in the 21st century because of what Christians believed in the first century. I mention all of this today so that you will hear this. They wanted to kill Christians from the very beginning. From the very beginning. There's an ancient document, the martyrdom of Polycarp, written in 155 AD. Polycarp was the bishop of the church of the city of Smyrna. And there were witnesses there watching as they were executing Polycarp, lashing him to the stake, about to burn him. And the words recorded coming out of Polycarp's mouth as he's about to be killed are, 80 and five years have I served him and he has done me no wrong. How could I abandon him now? They're about to light the fire to roast him and he is praising and preaching Jesus. Why? Because he had a supernatural joy from this Christos Kyrios way of living that he didn't care if they killed him. Now, I compare that to the mindset of many modern-day believers. What would we do? We'd probably try to plan a protest. Maybe we'd hop on social media and really roast everybody with our hot sports opinions. Talk about the way that we'd been aggrieved. You see, we don't know what real persecution is. We might have a persecution complex, but we don't know what persecution is, right? But when they're lighting the fire on Polycarp, he's expressing Christos Kyrios joy. And I think about that for us today. I think about the fact that if you want to have defiant joy in a world that is broken and out to crush you and out to always go against the way that it means to live the things and the way of God, you have to have a joy that circumcedes circumstances. That's what joy is. Not something that's dependent on how much money you make. Not something that's dependent on how much you achieve. Not something that's dependent on whether you're married or single. Not something that's dependent on whether you have children or no children. Not something that's dependent on where you live. But instead, something that even if they're going to kill you, you are fired up about your joy. For me, over the eight years I've been at Houston Northwest, the most persistent vision of joy has come through our special needs ministry. It's called My Place here. Maybe you're familiar with it, maybe not. But I love those kids and adults and the way that they express joy. 
Have you ever heard T.J. Lessinger singing in here in this room while we're singing? You may not understand what he's saying, but he's singing to Jesus, even though his body is limited physically. Or if you've ever been grabbed by Michael Kendrick, him grab onto you tight and look at you and say, who? He's letting you know that he sees you. And oddly enough, even though their bodies are completely incapacitated, they possess an otherworldly joy. Why? I can't go into all the reasons for that. I've talked about this in other places, but basically I think to remind us that joy is possible no matter your physical circumstances. No matter what, you can have an otherworldly joy. And by the way, if you want to help out in our My Place or children's ministry, you can do that. They need help and they'll have a table set up here out at the Connection Center whenever we're done today. But when you talk about joy in the middle of less than optimal circumstances, I think that too often we are miserable because we're so inwardly focused rather than being focused on the glory of the message that was given to the shepherds by the angel that is for us even now. A message for all people. A message of great tidings, of great joy, which is this. You get to live the Christos Kurios way. You get to live no longer giving final and first allegiance to any government, no longer first and final allegiance to any other family member, no other final and first allegiance to any other outside power, but instead first and foremost allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ and the way of life he teaches us. This is amazing and powerful. This is our God taking on flesh as a babe, declaring that humanity is worth more than any other part of creation. That's why he chose to become human. We're not simply clumps of cells. We're not simply slime, but instead we are something worth far more. This is our God growing from a babe into a man, one who chooses to willingly embrace crucifixion. Embrace the crucifixion so that the stain of sin might be removed from you, might be removed from me, and instead placed on his broken body. This is our God crucified as a man, now resurrected to let us know that one day death and Hades itself will be thrown into the lake of fire, the death of death, because this God has nothing that can stop him. Oh, death, where is your sting? A God who seeks out humans, a God who takes on the penalty for sin, a God who conquers death, and a God who says, you can know the taste of heaven now if you'll live the Christos Kurios life now. This is the good news. As the angel said, it's a message for those with whom he's well pleased. In other words, it's for everyone, but we have to say yes to it. You see, not everybody today who will hear this message will opt to surrender to it. It's difficult, it's challenging. You want to, you might even be convicted to, but you won't cross the line of faith. But some today will. Some who are in this room, some who are watching online, in a group this size, there are people who have yet to make the full decision. And today, you will decide to welcome in heavenly, divine, supernatural joy because you will choose to let the Christos Kurios be the way of life. Christ is. Lord. Today, some of you feel miserable and forgotten, and today you realize that God sees you. He is your Christos Kyrios. Today, some of you feel skeptical, and you have been crying out to God for a sign, asking Christos Kyrios to break in, and today, I pray that he will. Others of us today are like Scrooge, trapped in prisons of our own making. We're miserable, not because of something that has happened to us, but because of a bitterness that we've allowed to take root in our heart, and we can turn to Christos Kyrios and ask everything to be remade. Some of us today need to proclaim faith in our Lord for the very first time. We've been making other things our Lord, but today Jesus Christ is called to be our Lord. You can respond in any number of ways. (laughs) You can text. We're going to put a number up here on the screen. You can text in and let us know that you're ready. Maybe if you're watching online, there's a button that you can press. It says raise your hand or you can chat with us. Let us know that you're ready. But sometimes people say, well, why do I have to do that? Why does it have to be public? Can it just be something private? I'm gonna tell you why I think the answer to that is no. I think that if in the first century, Christians were standing up under penalty and threat of death, saying, Christos Kurios, knowing full well that they could be strapped to stakes and burned because they wanted others to know publicly that Jesus was indeed their Lord. 
If that's what they were doing in the first century, why wouldn't we publicly say yes to him in the 21st century? In fact, on the first Sunday of the year, 2021, we're going to have Fresh Start Sunday. And I'm going to ask anybody in this room or anybody watching online who has yet to be baptized to be baptized on that day. We'll do them indoors or outdoors, whatever makes the most sense for you. But I think that it's time for those of us who have been delaying to say, I'm ready. I'm ready to go public with my faith because this supernatural joy needs to be shared. So we go public. Hey guys, thank you so much for listening to this week's sermon here at Houston Northwest Church. Our vision is to make Houston more like heaven by helping Houstonians like me and you become more like Jesus. Now, if you have any questions about following Jesus or you made a decision today to give your life to him, please let us know. Text Know Jesus to 281-946-6500. Connect with us throughout the week at hnw.org. And again, thanks for listening. Enjoy the rest of your day and we cannot wait to see you again next time. Peace.